All right, so let's get started again. We're going to move on to our panel discussing machine learning and artificial intelligence in entrepreneurship. Um, and we're very fortunate to have as our moderator for this panel, Marina Neissner, who um, we lost recently as a professor at Yale, and she's now a vice president at AQR Capital Management. But we're thrilled to have her back um, to lead this interesting discussion. So take it away, Marina. Perfect. I'm going to sit on this side. Um, okay, thank you very much, Brian, for asking me uh, to moderate this. So first of all, it's lovely to be back. Uh, and also, as a moderator, you get to basically ask really, really brilliant people in this area any questions that you have. So it's a pretty good gig. Um, Oh, before I start, so a quick reminder, there will be, if I forget to tell you guys at the end, there will be a lunch in the courtyard just outside uh, right after this panel. So what I would like to do is I want to briefly introduce uh, the panelists today, and then I will let each of them briefly describe kind of the companies that they're working on and for. And then um, I have some questions that I wanted us to talk about. And I will leave about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for audience questions. OK, so let me just start kind of in order. Uh, we have, first we have Shaheen Kanda of uh, First AI. So Shaheen is the CEO of First AI. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence startup that helps collaboration and information creation in fixed income asset classes like leveraged finance and CMBs. Uh, the company works with leading financial institutions and is an alum of Barclays, uh, Barclays uh, Techstars, and the FinTech Innovation Lab. Um, then over there we have Nathan. He's the CEO and founder of uh, Ford Lane. He was a quantitative researcher uh, at CQS, a top five global hedge fund group, in fixed income credit at BNP Paribas. And he also served as enterprise architect at the GSC and 980 billion exchange. As an entrepreneur, he has co-founded three startups in travel technology and entertainment with leading industry uh, executives. And then last but not least, uh, we have Jason Briggs of Diffio. Jason is the chief operation officer at Diffio. It's an artificial intelligence startup that builds a collaborative teammate technology for defense and financial service customers. Jason is leading Diffio's expansion into financial services. And while studying computer science and military history at Williams College, he co-founded Meta Search in 2014. And then Meta launched uh, to thousands of beta users before being acquired by Diffio in uh, 2016. So that is some background on our panelists. And now if you guys want to take a couple of minutes and tell us more about yourself, but also the firms that you're working on. Thank you. So uh, my name is Shaheen, and uh, I created this company uh, partly because of my personal experience uh, during the financial crisis. So essentially what our company does is it extracts and creates data sets from credit instruments, and particularly credit instruments which are very opaque. Um, instruments like uh, leverage finance documents, CMBS, and others. Uh, and this kind of was this is crystallized and the insight came during the financial crisis. So I used to be an investment banker. I spent almost a decade of my career as an investment banker. And during the peak of the crisis, what happened was that we dealt with syndicated loans. This asset class used to be stable. It used to trade in a very narrow band. And suddenly during the crisis, no one knew what was inside a lot of the deals. And we could see price, pricing pressure on this asset class. I'm sitting in a seat where I know almost everyone in my institution knows a lot of the inside uh, and the insights of the deal, but the deal team is changing. People are getting fired. They're just the, uh, the deals have to trade in the secondary market, but we just cannot move it because the, there's so much information asymmetry. And that kind of had been playing on my mind about how you can actually reduce the information asymmetry in some of these highly traded asset classes, uh, which are pretty unstructured in their format. So that was the genesis of uh, our company, and today we sell our product to investment banks, to large data companies, and uh, to CLOs. 
Uh, my name is Nathan Stevens. I'm the CEO and founder of Forward Lane. And Forward Lane creates personalized uh, insights for wholesalers um, in asset management to share with uh, financial advisors uh, that they're selling product to. What we found is, um, is that this actually generalizes to wealth management. Wealth managers need to, uh, to do the same thing with their clients, provide better, better advice to their clients, to commercial banking, and actually to many other avenues uh, of finance. Um, the way that we do this is we, uh, we read news, research, and other content uh, using NLP that we custom designed uh, to read information like a CFA level analyst. So kind of solving that problem of quality information in and quality information out. Uh, then we have a recommender system which actually uses uh, the basis of an expert system um, to kind of solve that cold start problem uh, with recommended systems. We, we think that each firm, large financial services firms, have got their own IP. Uh, that is embedded in the best practices of, of their people. So they want to keep that, and of course they want to leverage that. So we build that into the recommender system. The recommender system uses that as a starting point, as the seed, but then learns from the real-world interactions uh, with the type of learning called online learning with a meta-algorithm that's evaluating millions of features as they're coming back and continuously updating these recommendations. Um, so this is really what, what Forlane does. And actually, similar to Shaheen, I was, uh, I was a quant uh, in, in London, and we saw the uh, financial crisis 18 months out and uh, made some really great trades out of it. But when I saw the impacts of the financial crisis here in the US on uh, a lot of people, the mass affluent uh, category, retirees, millennials, uh, they lost 38% of their portfolio. And I thought, could we do something to bring this institutional level information and bypass uh, you know, all of these inefficiencies and get it straight to the people uh, on the ground so that millions of people could effectively make the right decisions at the right time? Uh, so this is really the basis behind our B2B business. Plug it into all the, the top financial institutions. Take this best thinking and deliver it straight through to the people at the right time. So that's forward link. Great. Um, so I'm Jason, and at Diffio, we're building these AI-powered research assistants that connect to all the things that an analyst does every day on their desktop, like Microsoft Office, their browser, uh, different web applications that they may be using, to try and understand what's the user's context in this time and what are their knowledge gaps. Then the system goes and actually runs queries to data systems, internal data systems, uh, public web systems, and third-party content systems to try and uh, discover the answers and understand what's missing, and then brings that information back to the user and displays it right next to their work. So you have a question, you're working on some report, Diffio is going out and building queries to find information that will fill in your knowledge gaps in real time. So the, the genesis here is, as was mentioned, um, I started a company called Meta Search, which was a consumer-facing company designed to take Google Drive, Dropbox, Evernote, Trello, all these cloud apps that we have, and the files on our Mac, and make them very easy to search. So um, you know, you've, got, you've got all these different cloud accounts, and it's very difficult to find what you need. It basically was designed to help my mom fix her messy desktop. Um, and we took that, that platform, deployed it. We had thousands of users. But we started to see that the, the limitations of search, uh, because you don't really, most of the time, you don't know what it is you're looking for, and you don't know how, what queries to formulate in order to pull that information back. And most importantly, we saw people connecting these you know, 3 million file, 10 million file Google Drives from their enterprise, where rich, very amazing information existed in those drives. But how do you even know that it exists, and how do you even search for it? So then we started to build uh, this idea of a recommender system, um, similar to what you were describing, where the system is able to see all the, the file hooks, so all the activity in Google Drive and Dropbox, and use that to actually recommend the right next step, the right next piece of information that will help the, the, the user. And that dovetailed really nicely with some of the things that Diffio were doing. Uh, so we, we brought the two companies together, and now we're focused on enterprise customers. but. The end goal is to build this collaborative teammate that can understand everything that the user is reading and writing, and then recommend the next best step, action step, or the next best piece of content that they need to understand in order to complete their task. OK, uh, thank you very much. So uh, in terms of topics today, first of all, the title of the panel is The Role of Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence in Entrepreneurship. And that's why we have well, three entrepreneurs here. 
Um, and also part of ELSOM is sort of the unofficial motto is business and society. So also in the panel, I want to emphasize a little bit part of sort of the society part, um, and that is, I think, something that also is relevant to uh, all three of the companies. And also I wanted to point out the first two talks, uh, there was a little puppy and there were cute little ducklings, so we really need to up our game here. <laughs> um, but so the first uh, topic I wanted to talk about is property of uh, machine learning that people talk about that it's sort of garbage in and garbage out. So machine learning and artificial intelligence, as was emphasized in the, particularly in the first couple, uh, in the first two talks, it learns using output that a lot of humans produce. And if there are, for example, biases in societies, um, if there are biases in hiring and text, then the, machine learn, uh, the machines, they're not sort of born that with some ethical ideas, right? They learn from the things that humans make. And so as a result, obviously, it can be either sometimes even emphasized or amplified, but also definitely potentially not diminish kind of those biases if you use machine learnings. And I think there's sort of several questions here in the sense that, you know, should companies, is that even the task sort of a businesses to deal with this issue or should it something that society be dealing with? Um, and then if the answer is yes, sort of how can, you know, how do we know when to step in? So part of machine learning is it's sort of unsupervised and suddenly you have this kind of human input. Um, so I was wondering what your kind of thoughts are from your businesses in particular, but also your experiences in general. Yeah, so, you know, I can address that from a very specific standpoint and then generalize from there. But I work in the credit space. And, you know, in my narrow world, if I were to describe what a normal deal looks like and where biases can get built in, imagine doing a transaction in a, transa in a deal space where a private equity company is buying another company. Um, if you're buying the paper which relates to that transaction, um, as a human being, as a human being who's sophisticated and has information about um, the overall context of that deal, over and above like the credit analysis of you know, figuring out where the industry is and what the cycle is and what the cash flow projections are and so on and so forth, there are a lot of other things that you as a human being might be thinking about. You'd be maybe thinking about the quality of management. You, you may have heard the CEO and the team speak you know, some events and you'll form a view on whether how capable they are. You may have a view on the quality of ownership, like the private equity company itself. And you may have plenty of other opinions uh, which actually form a full picture of the deal. And these, if imagine if a machine learning product is not going to actually pick up those kind of details, it will be biased against just assume firstly every management is kind of standard and there is no there are no outperformers and so on. So there are plenty of ways in which biases can actually get built in even in the credit world. Um, the way we try to work with that and you know this is in, in our world that makes a huge difference because it makes the product less or more valuable to our customers. So in general the general principle we use is that the moment you identify a bias you shed light on it. So if you call out and you kind of make people evaluate it and then opine on it and have, um, you know, ha you have an, like a, a set of their opinions, whether it's, it, it can be a perfectly qualitative opinion, it can be quantitative, but eventually that, if, if you can call it out and let, you know, let your users, the way they create the evaluation models, just have a view on it, uh, you can start to quantify it. So I think in, what we've seen in our world is that you may, you, know, you may not be able to identify every single place that there is a bias, but if you can create the mechanisms that to the extent someone notices it, they can call it out and start to quantify it, then you can actually start to reduce the number of biases. And I feel you know, it's, that's true as we, you know, I, I have a, obviously a stronger view in my own product and in my own world, but uh, with everywhere else, I mean, you know, light is, shining a light on something is the quickest way to remove the bias. Once you identify it, do something about it to start to quantify it and it will go away. And how do you go about um, sort of who do, you, uh, who do you trust and how do you go about sort of deciding whether it is a bias? Because that can also be quite subjective. Yeah, so again, like I, 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 we deal with it in a narrow world and in that space we put some controls over it. So for example, let's take something even as narrow as the quality of management. Whose opinion should matter? Yeah. Uh, which kind of, should it be an investor's opinion? It, should it be the banker's opinion who's closely working with the management and has like a, a, you know, an incentive to improve 
the opinion of the quality. Uh, so you, the way we try to do it is kind of, again, shed a light, kind of see, you know, give a profile of where the opinion may even come from, mm -hmm. so that everyone who wants to take that input can put their own weightage about how much, how, how valuable they would consider that opinion and go from there. Thank you. Our point of view is that, um, is that uh, bias creeps in when you don't include humans in the equation. Um, and, and it starts with model design. So uh, what are you actually putting into your model? Um, so if it's a hiring model, do you include race and gender? Um, because you, you prob probably should, because then at the end, uh, you would know whether or not that that's a, a feature that is, is actually explaining some of the results or not. And then run it again without race and gender and see if there's a difference. Um, so I think uh, a lot goes into the design of the system. Um, we think, tend to think about machine learning um, as you know, humans plus machine. Uh, humans have got context, um, and, and I'll, I'll give two examples of that. So, uh, so we largely look to empower you know, large asset managers in selling their funds to financial advisors. So it's a sophisticated sale which typically revolves around investment strategies or products or what's not in a portfolio, which should be in a portfolio. Um, so firstly, we have to understand the, the, the content to a good level. But secondly, we have to kind of cross that barrier of trust with the, the person. And you know, even though they are smart, they're actually salespeople. So, I've got this gut instinct. Um, so what we do is we, we build in their own logic. Um, so when they're seeing the story that's being surfaced, whether it's a research report or uh, an investment strategy that's being suggested or recommended, it's actually kind of giving them their own explanation back. Uh, so I think that this explainability, building it into a model, and, and that's, that's a kind of a simple experts list system slash rules engine, but it's married with a much more sophisticated recommender engine, which then learns. Um, so in this way, the, the, they can kind of swipe left or swipe right. This didn't work for this reason, or no, like that guy already owns that, or he would never buy that because it's just, it's just not, not on, the, on the run right now. Um, and we try and capture that feedback. And so they actually have to have a, another layer of learning, which is monitoring the real world behavior and the dynamic element to it too, because it can be because the user interests change, or behavior is different, or because markets have changed. Um, so really, it's a completely dynamic environment. And you almost need to be making those decisions on, on a daily basis as to how are things changing, are we explaining things in the best possible way, and is, is the reasoning that's being provided, is that actually marrying up with what humans would expect? Um, and I'll just give you another example too. Uh, outside of asset management uh, related to hiring. So we work with, um, with a machine learning company uh, called Apt. Um, they're a great company, so I'm happy to say their name. And they use uh, machine learning to marry candidates uh, to roles uh, in an innovative way. So we've been looking to hire a business analyst, and they did a great job. Uh, the, the model came out. Uh, we met with uh, uh, the candidate, had one final candidate, and we're, yesterday, we're, we're on the verge of hiring her. She had said in all the interviews that she loved being a business analyst, highly qualified. And then in a call last night, I discovered that she's actually decided she wants to do something else. She's not sure she wants to be a business analyst. So I tried to appeal to what she, she might want to do in the future. And she said she didn't know. Even though she's worked in wealth management, asset management, she's run a book of insurance. And so she, she just doesn't know. Uh, so that's human context. I struggled with a deep understanding. <laughs> I was surprised. Um, but, but there, again, it's a uh, machine can only go so far. It did remove bias. She was a great candidate. Uh, but then again, we didn't have that context. And I think that, that that's a, a good analogy for machine learning, what works, what doesn't work, and where humans can come in and provide that context. So it has to be sort of an interactive process. Definitely interactive process. 
Okay. Yeah, and for us, uh, bringing it back to the, the actual Diffio product, basically while you're, you're, you're looking at your screen and you're doing a task, whether it's a research report or you're doing uh, investor onboarding, something like that, um, Diffio is going and finding this information. What it, one of the core ranking metrics we use when we display the information that Diffio found is novelty. So how likely is this to be something that the user doesn't already know? Um, potentially from a data source they never would have considered. And that is a very helpful way to combat bias, um, at least at a very, a very basic level, where what we found is that without Diffio and bef before Diffio was deployed, um, there's these very tight loops, workflow loops that users are used to and they introduce a lot of bias. They have these three data sources that they always go to, they always do this type of query, and they rely on that information 100% and then they keep continue that cycle. Um, and being able to have another system go and query the rest and potentially bring you information that you would never have even considered is something that challenges your own hypotheses a lot of the time, but is very useful because you never would have considered that data otherwise. Um, and so that, that idea of novelty added into the quality of the recommendations that Diffio is providing is something we found to be very helpful um, in, in fighting that bias. Because uh, the reality is that humans are incredibly biased already, and um, anything the, system, the machine can do to even improve on that a little bit is, is, is helpful. Um, that's very interesting. I think I read something related to this, um, probably in The Economist, that's what I mostly read uh, recently, that they're using, and you know, I assume that's true, but I don't know for sure because media can overblow things, um, that they're using machine learning in meetings. So if, for example, sometimes it happens that everybody makes the same assumption and then just kind of everybody moves on from there, but never challenges that first mm -hmm. assumption. And so machine learning apparently can help you notice some of these things and the same way if like you've never considered a certain data set, they might bring it to your attention or data source. Mm -hmm. um, One really interesting uh, company I read about the other day, uh, they took take all of your internal email and calendaring data from, from within an enterprise of the sales force and they match that up to the revenue that it actually w exists from each of those customers and try and figure out you know, how much are, are, are we spending way too much time on the wrong customers um, because just maybe they seem important in our minds and that, like all these different types of methods to uncover biases that you would never want to think of but can actually bring real ROI to the, to the business by destroying the bias. Yeah, so maybe it sounds like the outcome is not, the goal is not necessarily to just remove kind of all bias from machine learning, yeah. but it will always be sort of some interactive process yeah. where humans and machines kind of work together. Um, that's very interesting. So one other topic sort of very related that I wanted to talk about, and I think it was actually Charles that uh, briefly brought it up uh, in the end of his talk, that if you sort of read the media and uh, it often sounds like you know, we'll all be out of a job, especially in finance, uh, now that I moved into the private sector, um, because machines will just you know, take over all our jobs and everything can be automated and that sounds sort of very scary. Uh, but what media, I think, less often emphasize are some of the synergy or maybe some positive ways um, that this could, be, could play out. And again, not that, you know, I don't want to claim that nobody will ever lose their job to a machine, but I think there could be some ways in which uh, things can actually get better for certain people that are never emphasized in the media. And I was wondering, you know, all of you being sort of in machine learning, what your thoughts were on that from your companies and also in general? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I appreciate that point and I appreciate the points made earlier that definitely puts a lot of kinds of roles at risk. And I, I think, you know, it feels like an analogy to the almost like to the early days of like getting electricity type of thing where initially everyone you, you know every, if everyone is going to be in a reactive mode then of course there will be a section of jobs that will get initially wiped out and then probably like a few decades later when I, once the dust has settled a new kind of industries will get created and everyone kind of settles back in but I, I think that is kind of a huge social uh, you know you're, we're asking for like huge social adjustment um, in my own world, like if I were to look at credit, for example, I can see that while we are creating a product, we are creating a product where you know, we are basically helping large institutional customers. Uh, hopefully that increases liquidity, uh, increases trading levels and so on for them. Um, as a company, our, the way we are set up and the way we've, you know, we are incented really is to be able to make sure that these large customers can pay us and that's how we can be revenue positive. Um, credit in and of itself can, doesn't need to be used only by the largest companies. It's every single small and medium-sized business in the country technically can use it. 
but here we are, we are going out only to the largest companies and you have to ask the question why, right? So I think, I mean, I had studied a course in political economy like a very long time ago. There was this concept of, uh, you know, <coughs> concentrated costs and distributed benefits. And I feel AI is like that. There is a huge concentrated cost in actually building out a, a reasonably sized technology. And we are being, and at some level, the benefits are not going to be widely distributed, not if a company is going to have to build this kind of a product. So I, I don't think it's the technology which is a problem. The technology is fantastic. If this kind of, the, everything that we're doing for like large companies right now, technically if this could go out to like, you know, every small like grocery store and barber shop, uh, almost everyone could ac access capital markets. Like this is a separate other conversation, but the way, the channels through which we currently access capital markets uh, are, it's, it's so expensive to, uh, to set yourself up for that channel that you have to be a large company. If we slash the costs for what it takes to get into that channel to like we have one hundredth of the cost, a very different size company could actually access capital markets. So, so there are structural problems which technology could have solved, uh, but it's just the incentive system that you cannot expect small companies or any size companies that are supposed to be a for-profit enterprise uh, to put a lot of resources when the benefits are going to be distributed out to the wider society. I think the, it just needs a kind of structural rethink uh, because this should be infrastructure. It should be infrastructure that everyone should have access to and if that happens, it basically opens up a lot of opportunities. So, so one solution might potentially have to come from either the government or sort of wider society. Yeah, like it, it's just, it, it could be anything. It could be say a public-private pu partnership. Mm -hmm. So like even a company like ours, right? If, Today, we would always have to raise capital from large private enterprises because that's how it, we are going to be able to grow. If I knew that the government had like this gigantic fund, which is going to probably be a public-private partnership and is going to let us actually go out and make it possible for smaller companies also to have access, yes, we would put resources, but we just don't have the right incentives. So I think part of it is, you know, it's a social problem because we are putting the, it's, it's an expensive product to build. Creating machine learning, which sustainably over a long period of time can, you know, start to have better predictive ability and be uh, able to match certain very specialized use cases well, it takes time and it takes capital. So if you put that kind of time and capital, uh, invariably the pub private enterprises are going to pick it up, and you know the public is going to get left out. So I think there is a it's a structural imbalance. No, there, it sounds like there are definitely a lot of externalities that are yeah. not always captured by the firm, and that's uh, interesting. I think um, from our point of view, um, yeah, we're we're primarily focused on uh, bringing efficiency, productivity gains to uh, to a variety of. Um, of intermediaries and financial services. So uh, one example is commercial bankers. Uh, commercial bankers have to cover you know, 2,000 different small and medium-sized businesses. So how are you actually going to provide the right product or right service to, to those people if you don't? You're going to have to become an expert at so many different types of businesses. So this is a perfect use case for machine learning where we can use NLP that reads the websites, looks at the supply chain, looks at the business models, uh, takes all the, the structured data around the transactions, pieces together what that, uh, that, that uh, supply chain looks like, um, and then also looks at interesting articles um, and marries that all together um, and, then, um, and then runs uh, some, a series of rules or recommendations uh, around that. So that when that commercial banker reaches out to that client in their CRM system, they have three stories to share with that client. They become uh, an instant expert on what that business does, how that entrepreneur is thinking, uh, uh, and what might be relevant uh, to them in, you know, at a, a kind of broader level, industry level, and also at a supply chain and a very local level, like their, their zip code. Um, so this is really fantastic. It's, it's, uh, relationship managers say it saves them around eight hours a week, about 32 hours a month uh, of time saved. So imagine getting back uh, almost four, four to five days per, per month. Uh, big gains. Um, and then the really interesting thing is kind of by taking this blend of taking their IP or their thinking and married with the machine, uh, they actually say it, it achieves the same or better than uh, human level results around 80% of the time, but the variation is very, very low. So even when it doesn't achieve the same or better than human score, 
it, re it, it retains around 90%. So if you're going to rate it a, a 9, the machine will come back with an 8. If it's going to be an 8 that a human comes back with, it'll be a 7. So you're getting very, very close here. And so if it's, if it's kind of good enough and it makes people happier uh, with a better product, sells uh, more, it kind of creates more human connections here. The interesting thing is that the same problem actually works when you scale up the complexity into investment banking. Here, investment bankers have to look at M&A data. They have to look at uh, supply chain data, uh, the entire management structure, um, you know, a tremendous amount of data with lots of different steps. So here, you can actually break the problem down into a different set of rules, looking at a different set of data, uh, and just scale that out. Now, running across lots of companies, comp sets, and, and surfacing information where uh, you just don't have the human capability to do that. So investment bankers are being supercharged. Are they going to lose their jobs? No. They're going to just do better business, more deals, and grow their business. Are those uh, relationship managers going to lose their jobs? No. They're just going to provide better service to their clients. The clients are going to be happier with them. The brand's going to be better. So ironically, by, by using machine learning here, we're actually creating a deeper human connection with more trust, which is the thing I really like about it. So. Yeah, it sounds like there's uh, even the things that even the media covers, there could be a positive side to it, just the glass half full, half empty, that instead of now that's taking away your job, you actually have more time yes. to do something else that you weren't able to do before or more resources or something. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I would say much, much the same. Um, we th at Diffio, we think that there's now, we're a ways off from reaching a super intelligence where it can do everything better than us, and then who cares about anything at that point? <laughs> um, that's, that's a long way away. But one of the only, the only ways that we'll actually get to the point where AI is able to handle some of these more difficult challenges is by this deep collaboration with users. And that's why our whole platform, from a user experience perspective, is designed to work very closely and mimic another human collaborator while you're working on your task. Um, so we, we think that's the only way that, that uh, I think a couple of the talks earlier had talked about that. Um, the best current AI is that those pr uh, products that actually combine the strengths of the human, the analysis of the human, pattern recognition of the human, um, the actual ability of the human to go out and have meetings, um, and the speed of reading of a, of a computer, mm -hmm. basically. And so that's the, the, the way that we're able to sort of supercharge users. And, and for the next 10, 15, 20 years, those will be the most powerful AI applications. Um, are the no, ones. That's, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, one, even though one point that I read, uh, actually in Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, which I completely really agree with the kind of the super intelligence, and according to Charles, we don't even know if it exists, yeah. but it's far ways away. Um, <laughs> But it was interesting because often we're, we view that, okay, machines can do the machine stuff and then humans do the human touch. Um, but they were actually saying that uh, now, now they're thinking about having kind of AI in doctor's offices where, for example, we as humans are not always good at reading other people's emotions. So if you come in to the doctor and you're just angry or sad, the doctor can't always tell it but machines are actually getting better at that than humans. So that was just a little bit scary mostly because it's um, like, that's what we claim we're good at being human and it turns out machines are potentially in some areas are better than us at what we might think human means. Um, but I agree, I think that kind of a more broader picture that there will probably be a lot more synergies in the future and we'll, a we'll just be able to do things that we have not thought about or that we just could not imagine doing before. And on, on that point, we'll probably get to this later, but uh, the user experience we found is really important in how the, the analyst or the human or anybody perceives the way the AI is working. And a lot of the, the, these crazy news stories come from the black box problem where you don't know what the heck is going on inside of the computer to do this AI task. Um, and so uh, at least in, at Diffio, we very heavily how do you actually make the, what the AI is doing apparent to the user and provide whether it's evidence for the recommendation or for the, the uh, relationships that's being discovered or showing all the paths in that all the actions that the user took to get to a certain step. Um, all those uh, explainability um, user interfaces are very important for what we do because otherwise, uh, otherwise it just does seem like some black box and you don't trust it. But if you can 
visualize it as a human doing other tasks that you would do if you had the time, um, then it makes, it's, it makes it a lot more tractable, uh, which, is, which is on this point of, of, of black boxes and explainability is a very important topic in AI right now. Yeah, and uh, this is a, I guess I didn't plant this, but a perfect segue to my next topic. Um, so it's switching a little bit more to businesses and you know, your business in particular. I think, especially if your customers are uh, more what we think maybe retail people, retail investors, I, as, you, as Jason just mentioned, one issue with adaptation can be lack of understanding or lack of trust or explainability. And while, um, I guess Marcos mentioned, AI doesn't have to be a black box, a lot of people do view it as a black box, or it can be. And then it's, of course, very hard to trust something that you don't understand. So I was wondering how actually your companies in particular are, and you briefly mentioned um, a little bit about how Defio does it, but how do you think about it and deal with this problem when you're thinking about your customers? Yeah, so I think in our space, again, we are selling to expert users, yeah. people who are deeply familiar with what to expect as the data and the output. So uh, <clears throat> even if the user is a non-technology user, I mean, our users are typically non-technology users, um, we, we have an interface where they can actually uh, see the hypothesis of the engine and they can test it out. I mean, if you think that this is the right answer, you can try out a couple of combinations of things and you can see for yourself how it's consistently responding to you. So uh, we, it, it's usually an, kind of an early question that we'll always get because eventually users are using our product to expand their, their da data sets and they're kind of starting off with a small sample. Mm -hmm. So they can trust the overall system if they can see in that small sample that you know, they, they can see the logic of the engine and they can see the logic of the answers. Um, so I, you know, I think that, that I guess is less of a, it, it, is one of the, it is one of the issues we have to solve to be able to make the first sale. Um, yeah, I think when, for you in particular, when you have b business to business, right. it's a little bit less of a concern. I think it's more of a question, are you using the best algorithm possible, right. less of we don't trust this machine thingy. Right. And I think that, you know, that again, like how would you define what is the best algorithm, right? So like best to whom and best for what reason <laughs> and best for what outcome. Mm -hmm. So that is something that is, again, if we are con considering um, getting data sets which have, which are kind of touching across many types of problems, like you know, in in credit, for example, there is there is information in there which is just you know a, a human being can read the sheet of paper and come to that answer quite easily with minimal training. Like you know, who's the what's the name of the company that is doing the deal? What is the size of the deal? Mm -hmm. When does it start and when does it end? You know, there's no no conflict in that. But you there are there is there is ambiguity in you know. How, how how much leakage of cash can there be outside of the company from this all the stuff that's written in these like three sections, and that there is a, a, that requires expertise and that requires someone to know what are the specific things to be looking for as well. Yeah. So um, we have different techniques that are running always in the back mm -hmm. for each of these things, and what we tell our customers is that you know. The, the most efficient thing for you is not to try to tell, try to see how the algorithm works. Of course, that's our IP, so you can't see it anyway. But uh, you can relevant. The relevant thing is what is the, it, you know, there are multiple competing techniques running in the back, which is the best answer for you. And if it's consistently being able to pull up that best answer for you in, mm -hmm. in your different circumstances, then it's working. Is it, yeah, so it's up to individual customers to kind of decide right. what they're right. looking for. Interesting. I guess Nathan and Jason, it's a little bit more relevant even for you guys. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I'll just try and link this to something like a much broader issue here, which is, you know, if you look at uh, all of the, the big companies that are doing like machine learning at scale, so LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, and, and if you think about what's going on in, in privacy today, is there's a, a big backlash against all of these companies because we don't know what is being done with our data. Mm -hmm. And yet they actually all easily have the ability to explain exactly how every piece of information that's being displayed to us actually got there. Um, so you know, they're purposefully obscuring the traceability of that data. They know exactly where it's coming from. Yes. Could it show you where that comes from? Um, and, and help you to better understand that, not in an aggregate way that's completely div you know, not matched to what, what, what you're doing, but directly. Um, so I think that there's, there's actually a big opportunity to build trust here 
But, uh, in that regard. A quick question actually on that directly, um, because kind of what Marcus mentioned earlier, when you have physics and you write about physics, it doesn't change gravity. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas here, if uh, like I, I'm not gonna lie, I find it slightly creepy when you know you go to a store online and then the same thing that you looked at shows up in ads. Um, so if they showed you exactly, and here it's obviously quite obvious how it got here, yeah. but for a lot of things, if they showed you exactly what the process is, then that might change your behavior, and then you might, might act not in a way that's natural, the way you would like to act or they want you to act. I mean. So in, a, in an enterprise space in financial services, we have to show the provenance of that, of that data mm -hmm. uh, and the traceability and because it goes down to compliance, right? So these are regulated institutions. So uh, you know, the institutions that actually have much more effects than financial services firms, uh, for example, changing public opinion, uh, you know, what you think about, why are they not regulated? You know, why is there no traceability there? Mm -hmm. um, and why, why do, does the ordinary consumer not have access to that? So at Ford Lane, we take that very, very seriously, mm -hmm. and we provide full traceability to exactly how every single piece of information went into that decision to recommend this piece of research or article. Uh, so they can be tracked all the way back to its baseline data, and we expose that. Um, and, and I mean, we have a simple human reason to expose that, and that's because the salespeople, the relationship managers are all smart. They got a lot of context. They got a lot of experience. So if we don't explain to them uh, why it's there, they're not going to use it. And then we don't have a product because they don't trust it. So we try everything at every step of the way to build trust. Um, and you know, I think once you, you trust that that information is there, I don't know if, if any of you have been in a Tesla um, you know, with the, the auto drive switched on. Um, it's, it's very uh, jaggy, so, um, so when, you're, when you're on the freeway, it, it makes like, kind of like, almost changes like it's following a triangle, like a series of pixels almost. Mm -hmm. And it, it does not feel good at all. Uh, it changes lanes way too fast, um, and, and quite frankly, it's scary. So um, for me, I, I don't trust it. Uh, my brother-in-law has one, he <laughs> just lets it go. I, 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 I don't like it. Uh, I am the same as pretty much everybody in financial services, right? If, if I don't understand how it's working and, and if it doesn't feel right to me, I'm just not gonna use it, right? And until it feels right to me and I trust it, then I'll use it and actually then I'll be like, okay, you know what, now it's changing lanes smoothly, this is how I change lanes, feels intuitive, it's believable, okay, great. Now I don't have to worry about it so much, go right ahead, right? So that's how we think about things at Forward Lane. Yeah, so it sounds like it's not just about just understanding because uh, even if you understood why it's changing lane too fast, you still don't like the experience. <laughs> yes. um, but it's also almost mimicking kind of human touch to it yes. and then feeling a little bit more human. Yes, um, believability is important. Yeah, interesting. And to do yeah, that. and just to, uh, uh, at coming down a level, like less, less high concept, but the way that Diffio does it, if Diffio is, uh, you're, you're writing a report on some individual, you're doing a client onboarding or whatever it might be, um, and Diffio identifies there's some key connection to another person who was a, a very risky individual in the past, let's say, um, and a, a past report was done on that, it finds that in the shared drive. It will show you, uh, it won't just say, you know, there's this connection to this, this bad actor, uh, thumbs down. It'll show you, you can click evidence and you see all the documents that substantiate that connection, um, whether they came from the public web or from, from internal data sources, third party content, whatever. It's trying to show you all the, the evidence. The way that if, if I came to you and I said, hey, there's this really interesting person you should look into, and I didn't tell you why, you would say, go away, that's not helpful. But if I showed you all the documentation, I said, okay, well, I have, Here's, here's three of the best documents that substantiate it. I got a bunch more if you need to see it. Then it's that uh, uh, believability because it, you could say, oh, that's almost like what a human collaborator would do. And yeah, as you say, the, the making it seem like not just explainability, but explainability as if it were a human um, is very important. So you can rationalize it and, and feel uh, under, understand, like not understanding just like a, in a mathematical sense, mm -hmm. but understanding in a like an emotional state um, is, is very important, we found. But a lot of the th same things apply. Being able to show the full traceability of anything that the system does is important for compliance reasons, but also for 
usability and user excitement in a sales meeting. In sales meetings, we show the, the, the evidence features that our system has and uh, some of the traceability and the way it shows you how many queries it's running and where. Um, and then because of that, I think a lot of times we, we had one user uh, in one of these demos say, Wow, this looks like the first. I see a lot of AI vendors. This looks like the first AI that's actually useful. And I don't think he, it was a, a, a burn on all the other AI vendors. It was basically that he could finally see how it was actually working, and so now he could understand how it was useful, um, which was a very interesting uh, experience. Interesting. In and there's obviously a very fine line to walk. Um, kind of what you mentioned in the very be beginning of this conversation that uh, there's obviously intellectual property questions, you know, you don't want to disclose too, too much because at some point somebody could mimic you or, mm -hmm. um, but interesting. Um, I actually want to follow up on something that Nathan um, brought up just a minute ago in terms of data. So this is more maybe a broader question, uh, especially for you being in the machine learning world. So one concern that we, I think, all are facing is how do we deal with data? Um, with our personal data, and especially given that n not only do we not know how to, or a lot of us don't know how to value our data right now, but also we don't know what the capabilities are going to be in the future. And so how do we, I think this is a little bit more as a society, um, and how do you in particular with your data think about privacy, how to kind of handle that? And yeah, so I think like the separate the two things, my business is quite different from like this other question because in our business, uh, since we service large regulated financial institutions for the most part, they own their like they, they have pretty good guardrails around their data and their privacy. So that's almost part of the process of selling to them. Um, so I you know I don't think there is the, like our customers wouldn't be worried about yeah. this issue at all. I think for, for us as a society, I totally agree with you that uh, I think we haven't completely wrapped our head around how to monetize our own data. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, you know, I've read other people who have expertise and have put probably more thought and philosophical thought about this, about how we as consumers eventually in the future will own our data completely and someone has to pay us to be able to receive that data and uh, the, just the model would change. Uh, so there, there, are, there are people who are pushing along different directions. Uh, but, you know, I recognize the problem, um, and I know that there are others working on the solution. Interesting. Yeah, there are definitely, uh, I think, kind of issues with potentially us owning our data and selling it because we also get convenience from machines using right. our data and right. providing us with advice. Or Right. It's like the same analogy of, like, machine learning and AI eventually being some form of infrastructure. It's like having our roads and it being like the roads and train stations, and you pay your taxes so that you can access it, but, you know, it gives us something back. So mm -hmm. something to that effect. That's an interesting idea. Um, so, so for four-lane... Uh, we specifically don't let any personally identifiable data come anywhere close to our system. So um, even if it's, if, if it's internal to a financial services firm. So we use uh, encryption, so we'll have a hash code, and there will be metadata, uh, but there will be literally uh, no way of, of linking transactions to an account, uh, account information, or demographics to uh, a person. And the financial institution holds uh, a key store, and the actual user of the information held, uh, holds the unlocking key. So for us, that's how we handle security. We just basically don't deal with it. Okay. Uh, and we make sure that that does not happen um, so that all the data is safe. Um, I'm thinking more broadly um, in terms of uh, how should we think about the value of our own data. So, uh, Marina, I know you're involved in the ICO space and, uh, and looking at uh, uh, tokens and, uh, and blockchain. So there's a startup that, uh, that is, is now looking to help you monetize your own data uh, with an a, a ICO offering. And so in this regard, you get paid um, in coins, their coins, uh, which, you know, who knows if they're going to be worth anything or not. But if you provide your Facebook details, you get a certain number of coins. If you provide other different pieces of information, you kind of gather coins, so, which you can then monetize. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I guess, put that back into Ethereum or Bitcoin and, and do something with it. So I think that that's quite an innovative approach. Um, I think it's going to be difficult uh, for people to make that decision. Um, 
So, uh, so I think, but that's, uh, again, it's putting the control in the hands of the consumer. Um, but then, I mean, there's some questions behind that. Do uh, a whole new generation of young people effectively sell their data, um, you know, beforehand, before they even know the value yeah, of it. exactly. So <laughs> I think there's some ethical questions in, in that. I'm pretty sure I've given all my data away at this point. <laughs> and then the, uh, another a very interesting development is that Tim Berners-Lee, who uh, invented the World Wide Web, has just very recently launched a new version of the internet, um, which, you can, which you can look up, which is distributed um, and controlled, and it allows you to take back control from all of the large major companies. So, um, so I would go and, and, and get a, a, a new address on the new internet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of taking that, that, uh, that tokenization to uh, a much grander scale. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'll have to look up the new <laughs> internet. Um, and I guess, Jason, you potentially deal more even within your firm with some of the data because... Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for us, on the when we work with enterprises, all the information is and processing happens on site. Um, we deploy our systems on site. Um, that connects to a Diffio engine that's running in the cloud for publicly available information, and it crawls that and sends it into that engine. Um, but it's all uh, behind the firewall and, and maintained securely by the enterprise itself. Um, so we don't have as many of those, those concerns as others might. Um, we're lucky because in our background, uh, we've deployed similar systems uh, in defense where they have extreme security measures. And so um, we have production systems running there, which helps us a lot with the financial institutions uh, because a lot of the, the concerns are similar. Um, so on that front, we, we don't really uh, we don't like to store any consumer data, and so we're not too worried about that. Um, but on, to answer some of the more, more, more of what the question is, is asking, um, I think that there are uh, some people have concerns about data leakage and their, their private data being mined. But I think the vast majority of people don't really care at all. And I think that those people are going to be, they will defeat any of these tokenization schemes or identity tracking schemes um, or allowing you to sell your data because when 96% or whatever it might be of people don't actually care and they'll just give everything, no, they'll take the, you know, they'll take pictures of themselves on Snapchat, they'll post any, uh, the, the most extreme things in, in messages like on a public forum, um, then the, the, the battle is already lost, I guess. Um, and I, I, I see it for myself being part of the, the new generation, I guess, um, that doesn't really uh, see why it would be a problem to have that information available um, online, as long as it's it, as it's a, a very uh, clear. Basically, what we what we what we think now, I guess, and I'm speaking for for the for younger generation, is um, if either you put it online or you just don't talk about it or or say it or or have it any, stored anywhere, um, and they're almost one and the same. At least that's the way I think of it. Um, and so I think that there's this there's this. These, these schemes to win back our data um, will ultimately be fruitless, I think. So, so it sounds like there's potential and needs to be some education that goes along. Um, sure, or people just don't care and they will continue to not care. Or, yeah, <laughs> and, well, that's true. And, uh, uh, and because these companies are providing convenience and people, yes. people are paying for it um, with the convenience. They're getting paid for it with the convenience. Mm -hmm. That's, um, so yeah, so these are kind of the questions I had, but um, I'm sure our audience will take advantage of having the experts here. So uh, I guess if there are any questions from the audience. Um. Yes, I had this question. Um, it seems that with machine learning, in, in view of what, we, what we've heard today, that um, you could make the argument that it, it, by providing more information, that it provides, that it, that it leads to even more of a premium on the human input, the human interpretation mm -hmm. of, of the increased amount of data that's available. And I know as a portfolio manager as an, and as an analyst that, uh, you know, I think my, uh, my uh, value add is my interpretation of, of data, of strategy, 
of uh, psychological variables in terms of assessing management and so on. Uh, and I, I just, even more, I believe, after being here today, that, that it's uh, you know, an integrative function that AI is far, far from being able to accomplish on its own now. And I, I just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. And I think uh, one of the other speakers, one of the previous speakers mentioned the fact that um, the, 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 the best outcome really is machine learning combined with an expert human who can uh, kind of harness one another's strengths. What machine learning can do is it can pick out, you know, uh, it can work in scale, it can do some of the analyses you would have done by yourselves, it will probably be multiplied by a million times and ha do the side by side with you. Uh, everything I was mentioning about uh, experts uh, calling out all the biases and so on, uh, the, the idea was exactly as you mentioned, which is to say that machine learning is what we present to our users as well, is that if you have an expert user, you can kind of give them superpowers. That's really the whole purpose of a product and the purpose of using machine learning side by side with them. The machine by itself is not that valuable and the user by themselves eventually will have machines that will simply kind of get ahead of them because they're doing these mundane tasks of like repeating something like again 500 times to a million times uh, faster than a user can. Yeah, for us, what we, what one of our core objectives is, and this is one a line that we say, but users have actually said this uh, at a user forum we had a couple months ago, um, is trying to take the the eighty percent of the hunting and gathering tasks that are annoying and users don't like, um, and and allow you to actually spend eighty percent of your time on the analysis and only twenty percent on the hunting and gathering, and it's it's exactly that of taking an expert user and enhancing them because the all the manual querying and the discovery of data sources. Um, it's all taken care of by a system that can do it, you know, 100 times better than a human. Um, but you're able to spend much more of your time on those high value, high ROI tasks. I also think that, um, you know, at the same time, it's not just the smart expert humans that, that stand to benefit. Um, does anybody know who the, the current world cha uh, chess champion is? Uh, so <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's actually a team of amateurs and a computer. Uh, so this is the really interesting insights is that, um, is that it's not Deep Blue, um, it's not Kasparov, um, and it's not anybody else, and it's, diff it's not a grandmaster. Uh, it was a team of amateurs with a, uh, a highly uh, trained computer. And so I think um, that's a very interesting observation. And by the way, the, the US Navy is uh, taking the same approach. There are these uh, online war games that they're, uh, that they're uh, currently doing, and they opened it up to teams from the Pentagon, uh, as well as DARPA, and anybody else that just wants to join. So you can actually go and join these amazing war games and present these solutions. And then those, those can, can be up for consideration. And quite frequently, students or people just from the general public are actually coming up with better solutions than highly trained experts in the Pentagon. Um, so I think that this is, uh, this is a revolutionary part to it. So I wonder if it at some point will actually bring some more amateurs kind of closer to the experts. Yeah. You know, it goes back to one of the earlier things we talked about where <clears throat> we talk about like these social shifts and what happens to people with machine learning and so on. There are plenty of new kinds of careers that are getting developed and sometimes it's almost like people have to be aware of them because every organization of every size, it's just like how if someone, everyone needed to be on the internet and like not everyone did it immediately, but they had to do it eventually. Machine learning is going to be the same thing. Every organization is going to need it. And there is a whole new career path for people who know how to see the existing organization and the existing work and how to map it to what machine learning can actually bring and help that transition and help them to kind of build those uh, codependencies and build the synergies and uh, you know, create the right kind of offerings for their own organizations. That's a very good point and relevant to the students who are in the audience. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, so there is, I guess, are you announcing lunch? Yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists. Thank yeah, you. thank you.